In the 1950s, scientists, engineers, and composers invented new ways of making music. Tape recorders, marketed as sound reproduction devices for office dictation, broadcast, and home entertainment, were appropriated instead as tools for creating music. Digital computers, room-sized machines for processing business transactions and scientific calculations, were reimagined somewhat improbably as machines for producing and organizing musical sounds. And the electronic music studio emerged as a new offstage environment for music making. Two questions. Were these new technological means of music making, the tape recorder, digital computer and studio, considered to be musical instruments by their makers? And should we, as musicologists, organologists and curators, consider them to be musical instruments? I'll answer my second question up front. I'm going to argue that the tape recorder, digital computer and studio were the new electronic musical instruments of the mid 20th century. And to understand what kind of instruments they are requires us to embrace some new axioms in the way we think about musical instrumentality. To explain those axioms and to answer my first question, I'm going to present three case studies from my research in the collections of musical instrument and science and technology museums. The first case study focuses on tape recorders designed at the Canadian National Research Council by a team led by physicist Hugh Lacain. The second, computer music technology developed at Bell Labs by a group directed famously by Max Matthews. The third, the electronic music studio at the Institute for Psychoacoustics and Electronic Music in Ghent, Belgium. An exemplary, a, an exemplary institutional studio of the 1960s, designed and equipped under the technical direction of Walter Londrieu. Magnetic tape recorders were widely marketed after World War II as sound capture and reproduction devices for use in offices, broadcast studios and homes. But composers soon started using them for creative rather than purely reproductive purposes. Composers of music concrete, electronic music and tape music, as it was variously known, would record sounds on tape, transform them in various ways by manipulating the tape, playing it backwards at different speeds and so on, and assemble the resulting sounds into compositions by cutting the tapes up with a razor blade and sticking the fragments together in the desired sequence with splicing tape. A finished composition could entail many hundreds or thousands of splices and take many weeks or months to complete. Commercial tape recorders were not designed with those kinds of operations in mind. So engineers began to design custom devices or modify commercial units, as you can see on screen, so that they were better suited to the technical and creative demands of tape music composition. Between 1955 and 1967, Hugh Lacaine designed five tape recorders that allowed the composer to record, transpose, and combine sounds from multiple tapes by playing a keyboard, touch sensitive plate and fader bank. He used special high speed, low inertia tape transports so that vibrato and rapid changes in pitch, i.e. tape speed, could be applied. The keyboard was touch sensitive to allow expressive inflections of dynamics and the controls were ergonomically laid out to facilitate ease of playing. When Lacaine presented his tape recorder to the Institute of Radio Engineers in 1961. He gave his talk two titles, the tape recorder as a musical instrument and the tape recorder as a tool in the electronic music studio. Why did he refer to the device as a musical instrument in one title and a tool in the other? Perhaps Lacaine's duplicity was because he feared his audience might scoff at the idea that such a machine could be termed a musical instrument. 
or perhaps it was because he himself was uncertain or perhaps he saw the device as both a musical instrument and a machine tool. I prefer the third interpretation. The tape recorder's motor driven mode of operation places it in the category of a machine tool according to the criteria pro proposed by the philosopher of technology, Lewis Mumford. At the same time, the playability and high degree of expressive control that Lacan engineered into the device clearly place it in the category of a musical instrument as per Lacan's own criteria. Lacan's tape recorder is both a musical instrument and a machine tool. Digital computers were also commercialized after World War II as machines for processing business transactions and scientific calculations. And although for economic reasons, they were not nearly as widely distributed as tape recorders, those who had access and the right technical knowledge started programming them to produce musical sounds remarkably quickly. As early as 1950, Engineers had programmed computers like the, like the CYRAC in Australia and Ferranti Mark I in England to play music. However, the most influential experiments in computer sound came not from within the computing industry itself, but from the American telecommunications industry. In 1957, Researchers at Bell Labs, part of the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, AT&T, designed a system to process telephonic speech using an IBM 704 computer. The system comprised a hardware speech to digital converter called TapeX and software written by programmer Joan Miller to transfer the speech data into and back out of the computer. Involved in both software and hardware projects was a technician named Max Matthews, who realized that if the system could be programmed to transform and recreate speech sounds, then it should be possible to program the same system to produce musical sounds. Matthews initiated a project to do that and went on to earn the nickname, the father of computer music, a regrettable gendered phrase that erased the crucial contributions of his collaborators. Here is one of the computers that Matthews and his team worked with, Bell Labs' IBM 7090 data processing system. And here is another picture of a similar system that gives a better impression of scale and shows more of the system's hardware components. Computers like this were programmed by punching coded instructions onto cards using a card punch. The programmer would then take their batch of cards, hundreds of them potentially, to the computing center. The operator would feed the cards through the card reader, run the program, and the programmer would go back later and collect the output, which might be a printout, a digital tape, or another stack of cards. What Matthews did was to program the computer with cards coded in assembly language like the stack he's holding in the photograph to calculate a stream of numbers corresponding to the shape of a basic musical waveform. Then he used Miller's program to have the computer output those numbers on a digital tape like the tape Miller is holding. Then he used the Tapex machine, the speech to digital converter, which you can see in the background behind Matthews and Miller, to convert the digital data into an analog audio signal that could be amplified and auditioned via a loudspeaker. By doing so, Matthews proved that in principle, it was possible to program a computer to produce any sound wave. He then wrote two new programs to make the software slightly more approachable for musicians. The first program allowed the user to specify the parameters for a set of simulated virtual instruments by punching comparatively simple instructions onto a batch of cards, which Matthews referred to as an orchestra. The second program 
allowed the user to punch a so-called score onto punched cards to specify which sounds the simulated instruments should make. And this saved the user from programming in assembly language, which of course was a skill most musicians did not possess. In 1963, when Matthews published his landmark article, The Digital Computer as a Musical Instrument, he unapologetically used the term musical instrument to refer to the complex system of hardware and software that I've just described. And in a section entitled Playing the Computer, he described the process of programming the system by preparing punched cards. Thus, Matthews and his team defined a radically new kind of musical instrument, a machine capable of simulating the behavior of virtual musical instruments. They also redefined the idea of playing a musical instrument as an activity that involved commanding these automated computational processes ahead of time, radically dispensing with the instantaneous gestural control of sound production conventionally associated with the idea of playing an instrument. For Matthews, the digital computer was itself a musical instrument comprising multiple interconnected components and a machine capable of simulating the behavior of virtual musical instruments. One of the most striking developments in mid-century music culture was the rise of the electronic music studio. Between 1940 and 1967, 560 studios were established in 39 countries, according to Hugh Davis's International Electronic Music Catalog. The simplest studios comprised little more of a tape recorder and a microphone. Larger studios contained many more items, often a mix of commercial and custom designed hardware. A good example of the latter is the studio at the Institute for Psychoacoustics and Electronic Music, IPEM for short, which was established in 1962 in Ghent, Belgium. In 1966, the studio comprised 62 interconnected pieces of hardware, including waveform generators, sound transformation devices like filters and ring modulators, tape recorders, amplifiers and loudspeakers, and audio testing equipment. Many of these devices were commercial, tape recorders by Telefunken, uh, microphones by Neumann, tone generators by Bruhl and Kjær, and so on. But a significant number were built in-house by technical director Walter Londrieu. Examples include simple devices like ring modulators and more complex constructions like a tone generator that could produce 98 frequencies simultaneously and a pair of sequencers, one electromechanical built in the 60s, another voltage controlled built in the early 70s, which were designed to expedite the tedious process of constructing electronic music bit by bit on magnetic tape. Some of these devices now reside at the Musical Instrument Museum in Brussels. As was true of most studios, the components of the IPEM studio changed over time. New components were added, old components were removed or recycled as part of newer constructions. Indeed, the IPEM studio was regularly reconfigured to suit the needs of visiting composers sometimes including the construction of new devices according to their specifications. Were these devices considered to be musical instruments by their designers and users? Or was the studio itself considered to be a kind of musical instrument, perhaps? An article published in the Belgian magazine Onslant in 1962 gives some clues. In it, the studio is referred to as an electronic ensemble, a term that suggests a collection of multiple instruments. But the article also refers to the entire ensemble as a single instrument. Electronic ensembles, i.e. studios, are modern instruments, it says, 
casting the studio as a single instrument comprising multiple interconnected components. The article describes the studio as both an ensemble and a single instrument. I want to conclude by suggesting that the three technologies I've discussed, the tape recorder, digital computer, and electronic music studio, were in fact the new musical instruments of the mid 20th century. And to understand and accept them as such requires us to embrace a new set of axioms about what a musical instrument might be. Axiom one, a musical instrument does not have to be a single object. Electronic music studios comprise multiple interconnected components functioning together as a single instrument. At the same time, the components are reconfigurable and sometimes individual components might also be considered instruments in their own right. We can think of the electronic music studio as a form of composite musical instrument built from multiple interconnected instruments, but also functioning as a single reconfigurable meta instrument. Axiom two, a musical instrument does not have to be designed as a musical instrument. Or to put it another way, objects can be repurposed as musical instruments. The tape recorder and the digital computer are two prime examples. These devices were not designed or marketed as musical instruments in the first instance, but they became musical instruments when engineers and composers developed new techniques for using them as musical instruments. Axiom three, a musical instrument can also be a machine and machine instruments are played in a different way from conventional instruments. When a conventional musical instrument is played, there is an instantaneous causal relationship between the physical gestures of the musician and the resulting creation of sound. Whereas when a machine instrument is played, that may or may not be the case. When a machine instrument is played, the instrument itself executes a semi-automated process that is commanded and shaped by the musician. Musicologist Mark Butler calls this playing with something that runs. The musician's shaping of the machine process may or may not happen instantaneously. And that creates a fuzzy boundary between what we might call performance, happening instantaneously in the moment of sound production, and what we might call composition or production happening in advance of the music's eventual sounding. These propositions might seem controversial to those who prefer a more orthodox definition of musical instrumentality. And some of these axioms may not yet be expressed in quite the right way. This is research in progress, and I'm open to suggestions of how this conceptual framework might be developed further. But we need axioms like this, I suggest, if we want to fully understand and care for the new musical instruments of the post-World War II period. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>